the rest of Asia, is it too small for you? Um, you you incorporated domestically in Vietnam, you bought a, a bank in Indonesia recently. Correct. In Australia, you're trying to figure out how to go you know, forward in terms of... I, I think these are diff different markets. markets. I mean, Australia is a mature and very consolidated right. market. I don't anticipate that there's much to uh, right. do strategically in Australia. But outside of Hong Kong and China, um, you know, the rest of Asia, it's kind of a, the organic growth process is a little bit too slow, too small. And then there's this other opportunity, which is the um, RBS franchise that has come up for sale. Uh, did you look at it? Um, is there an opportunity to sort of jumpstart that, that process? Well, I think it's worth uh, noting that actually most of these countries, we've been there a long time, um, and we have been busy growing our franchise, you have, yes. in, consistent with what the regulations permit, and regulations differ from one country to another, um, uh, over, over many years now. And in some cases, there are also opportunities to buy uh, franchise or footprint. Um, and thus, as you mentioned, we bought a bank in Indonesia, which doubled our network. We took our network up from some 90 branches to 180 branches. Bought a bank in Taiwan also last year, uh, which gave us an extra 40 branches in the Taipei region. Very important because of the connectivity and commercial banking with the mainland, of course. Uh, we bought a retail broker in India. So if you look at the kinds of, of investments we've been making in a number of different countries, you'll see that uh, what, I, what, what I believe this is evidence of our capital commitment to investing in what are actually the most exciting economies of the world. And Vietnam, since you mentioned, is another one. I, th I see Vietnam as a country that's at a stage of development that's perhaps where, let's say, China was in the 1990s. Um, and I believe it will um, perform very strongly. I think it's got all of the dynamism that China has showed. Um, it's got a lot of foreign direct investment flowing into it. Uh, I think it's got immense potential. Um, and again, you don't plan your strategy for the next two to three years. You plan it for five, 10, 15, 20 years. And I see over that 20 year period, Vietnam emerging as one of the economic powerhouses of Asia. Well, if, given that we have to plan for 20 years, if you look at what's going to turn out in the next 18 months, um, assuming there are no surprises, um, how do you think your franchise is, is going to look like at the end of 2010? Um, oh, in terms of the overall pattern, it'll look at the end of 2010. I don't think it'll look materially different from what it is now. At the margin, we will have invested more uh, in certainly in risk-weighted asset growth in the faster growing markets. Um, we've taken our decisions on the US as discussed, so that, that, that will be a change in what our overall map looks like. But for the rest of it, uh, our business in India, our business in China, our business in Southeast Asia, our business in the Middle East, will con I believe will continue to grow over that period, even through that period, which is a relatively difficult economic period. We expect our risk-weighted assets in, in those parts of the world to continue to increase. I believe um, that there will be opportunities to grow market share in some key markets, because what we are seeing through this crisis is the withdrawal of some banks from these markets where they are not their core businesses. You've seen, I mean, I suppose RBS is an example of the point, withdrawing back into its uh, mm. um, home base uh, relative to its former footprint. Um, and you've seen other banks without, who may or may not have had actual physical op branch offices, but were lending into markets in the, the institutional level, beginning to withdraw. So that creates opportunities for market share growth. Mr. Green, I would like to touch on a topic that um, a lot of bankers are thinking about, and in fact, not just in banking, but in different aspects of the global economy today, and that's the question of leadership. How do you see leadership evolving um, in the aftermath of this crisis, given the fact that the leaders of global banks such as yours um, have been raked over the coal and you know, held accountable for a lot of um, poor practices uh, leading up to the crisis? There are a number of different ways in which we can um, deal with this topic. There is, the, the, at the very organic level, there's the question of skills and how that comes up through the system. HSBC is a bank where people like yourself um, have been part of the organization for years and the organic growth has wor worked well for you as an organization. At the same time, as you make these tactical acquisitions and and, and reconfigure your businesses in different parts of the world. You have to take on talent for which you have to pay, you have to reward it, and so on. What's top of mind to you in terms of 
the kind of leadership talent that you need to build within your own organization in the face of what's happening today? That's a very good question because at the end of the day, leadership is what makes a bank or, or any other business successful, of course. Um, a number of points. The first is that leadership isn't just about people at the, at the center or people at the top. Um, we have 300,000 colleagues around the world, and I take the view, and I, and I say this regularly uh, to, to groups of my colleagues, every single person in the organization has a leadership responsibility. However many people they may or may not have reporting to them on an organization chart, because everyone has the ability to influence someone else for better or for worse. And therefore, when you look at the question of the organizational cohesiveness and culture, which is extremely important to the sustainable growth of the business, and you, and you ask what is the culture, uh, what, is the, what is the degree of cohesiveness of the organization, um, uh, first, I, I place an immense, we place an immense amount of uh, importance on long-term commitment, integrity, professionalism, being able to look at yourself in the mirror in the morning and be uh, confident that what you're doing is making a reasonable contribution. These things matter, uh, and they matter not just um, because a board says they matter. They matter. Uh, they need to matter because everybody in the organisation feels they matter and seeks to live them out on a daily basis. I mean that may sound all rather um, nebulous, mm -hmm. but actually it's profoundly important to the quality of the business. No amount of rules and regulations, uh, handbooks and manuals and what have you, can ensure that a bank delivers good, sound and of course profitable services to its clients in a way that isn't going to embarrass uh, anybody, isn't going to damage the brand, but on the contrary going to reinforce that reputation. Um, no amount of rules and regulations is sufficient. You've got to have that organisational culture. And I think the most important task of senior management is nurturing that culture. So that says something about long-term commitment. It says something about making sure that your management team is, um, has a long experience of the institution, has a, a real commitment to it, uh, has a cohesiveness to it, so that there's, there's a shared endeavor. Um, that in turn says something about your understanding of leadership. Leadership can't be um, a matter of the ego, if you will. It can't be a matter of I, I, I. It can't be a matter of who's uh, on, 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 on the stage and in the, in the limelight. It's got to be something that's shared broadly through the organization. And there's got to be a real sense uh, of, uh, of that commitment to the quality of the business, as well as, of course, the technical professionalism, the, the knowledge, uh, the skill sets, and so forth that, that, that you also need on a daily basis. In all of the dialogues taking place in the global level, um, the Financial St Stability Board, um, the BIS, and so on, um, there's a lot of emphasis on compensation structures that are that are commensurate with the risk being taken. In terms of compensation, compensation. I think the, the most important thing is, is clearly payment in relation to real profits. For example, paying in relation to gross income or or day one PL. No, no, you need to pay in, pay in relation to real profits and you need to have enough stretch, have def enough deferral in the, in the structure of compensation that you're aligning, at least directionally, you're aligning the interests of the individual who's motivated by that compensation with the interests of the shareholder and indeed the regulator and the marketplace generally. Um, that's the most important principle. Now, getting that right in detail, of course, there is a lot of work get that right in the detail, but I think the principle's clear. Um, so far as we're concerned, we, we think we're in a really reasonably good space on that. The board sort of